بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحُصُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ حتى إذا فشلتم وتنازعتم في الأمر وعصيتم من بعد ما أراكم من بعد ما أراكم ما تحبون منكم من يريد الدنيا ومنكم من يريد الآخرة ثم صافكم عنهم ليبتليكم ولقد عفا عنكم والله ذو فضل على المؤمنين إذ تصعدون ولا تلوون على أحد والرسول يدعوكم في أخراكم والرسول يدعوكم في أخراكم فأثابكم غما بغم لكي لا تحزنوا لكي لا تحزنوا على ما فاتكم ولا ما أصابكم والله خبير بما تعملون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنته واهتدى بهديه إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما يفعنا وفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another session in this in this monthly monthly yes monthly series on the companions um, it's great to see that, uh, mashallah, I think this is the, the, largest attendance we've, the largest attendance we've had so far because a good number of brothers and a good number of and a good number of a good number of brothers and a good number of sisters. Before it was always either uh, either or, before it was always on one side there'd be there'd be less. So make sure you all stay to the end. Um, so yeah, so we the the. We begin in we begin in Mecca, which is where the Prophet ﷺ began his da'wah. But as we know, in Mecca, the the Muslims, the the, the small number who followed the, the Prophet ﷺ, they were persecuted in whatever way that the that the people of Mecca could uh, could could do. So, for example, Musa ibn Umayyah, he was from the one of the richest families of Mecca. And his mother would give him absolutely everything she could um, she could possibly give him, particularly in terms of clothes. So such that she would be able to say, you know, see that guy over there, the, the most well-dressed person in the whole of Mecca, he's my son. But when he became Muslim, she took all of that away from him. And uh, on top of that, she kicked him out of the house to the point that he was uh, struggling even to find food to, to survive off of. And others were even worse off than that. So eventually the Prophet ﷺ realized that you know now he's going to have to he's going to have to uh, leave Mecca and go somewhere else. So during the Hajj season, when all representatives from every single tribe from all over Arabia they all came to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ went to uh, present himself to them and see who would be able to take care of, uh, who would be able to guarantee him protection so that he would go and live with them. Um, and as, I mean, even to, to this day, I don't know if, um, well, if you can see that picture, but I don't know if that's Hajj or not, but during the Hajj season, um, you know, millions of people go to Mecca. And even at that time, when it was Hajj time, people from all over Arabia would come to Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went and presented himself to the different tribes. But one by one, they all kept on rejecting him for various different reasons until he came across a small group of six people uh, sitting on the side and he, he didn't even recognize who they were. And you know, subhanAllah, this also goes to show that uh, you know, we, uh, we do not know, Allah knows everything and we do not. And Allah's plan is perfect and our plans are never perfect. 
in this case, uh, you know, all these all these big, big Arab tribes who he was approaching, they were legendary all over Arabia. Because so basically, the Arabs at that time they had um, they were they were quite simple people, but they had a few things. So one is their language was very rich. They had very strong their, their language was very strong, and they had a couple of important uh, values or qualities, which were uh, generosity and bravery. And they would talk about this in their poetry all the time. So anyone who was very brave, they would get talked about a lot. Anyone who was very, um, very generous, they would also get talked about. And if someone, if someone was the opposite, everyone would know about them and they'd all be um, insulting them and so on. Um, and for, for example, there was, um, there was one man, I can't remember what his name was. He basically, basically there was a group of, of highway robbers. And he said, um, he, he, he basically, when he heard about them, he, he decided he's going to get, he's going to kill a hundred of them because they're all highway robbers and they're, you know, causing trouble for everyone. And when he actually encountered them, he actually got rid of more than 90 of them, but then they were also attacking him as well. So he was, when he was, so he was basically dying and he died on killing 99 of them. They were all highway robbers. Um, then someone, um, someone came and kicked the, his skull and a splinter went into his foot and because of that his foot got infected and he died a few days later. So these were all like the types of things that the, the, this, this person he became a legend. And these were the types of things which the Arabs would talk about, all their different feats of bravery and generosity. And these tribes, the big tribes who the Prophet was approaching, they were all known for this. Like this, this, the leader of this tribe, he's done, he's given away this much money and the leader of this tribe, he's done such and such a great thing in a war and so on. But of all the people who were there, Allah chose you know, six fairly unknown people to be the stepping stone for Islam to spread to, to all corners of the world such that it would reach us today in the 21st century. And so the Prophet he went to these people and he said, who are you? They said, we are from the Khazraj. Uh, they were from Medina. And it so happened that in Medina, there was a group of Jewish people as well, a group, there were Jewish tribes living in Medina as well. So, and they knew that the Prophet was coming, they were fully aware of this. Uh, because it says, it says so in their scriptures. And they'd been telling, whenever they'd fight with the Arabs, they'd say to them, just you wait until the Prophet comes, and then we'll destroy you like the people of Ad were destroyed. But when the Prophet came, of course, um, and it turned out that he was Arab and not from the Jewish race, then they refused to believe in him and they rejected him. Even though as it says in the Quran, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They know him, just like they know their own sons. And who's not, who's not going to recognize their own son? So they knew the Prophet fully well, but it turned out he was, he was not from the Jewish race, so they, they rejected him. But anyway, because of them, these people, they already knew that the Prophet was coming. So they, immediately when, they, when the Prophet spoke to them, they accepted Islam, they, 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 you know, they listened to the Quran and then they accepted Islam immediately. And um, uh, so then they, and so there were these six people. Now the main, the most important one, his name was, uh, uh, his name was As'ad, which means, um, so it's maybe a bit of a rare name, so it basically means to make somebody else sa'id, to make somebody else happy. So this man called As'ad, um, he appears later on. So they, so they, these six, they accepted, they go back to Medina, and they spread the message of Islam. And um, what happens then is, more people accept, and 12 of them return to Mecca the next year, and they speak to the Prophet Sallallahu And this time they pledge, they pledge allegiance to him. Uh, to, they pledge allegiance, and they pledge to, um, not to associate any partners with Allah, and not to steal, and not to commit zina, and not to do any of the major sins. Now notice here, there's not yet any mention of him coming to their city and protecting, and them protecting him. At the moment, it's just basically a pledge to be good Muslims. So they take this pledge, these 12 people, and they return to Medina. And this time, Musa ibn Umayr, the same one I mentioned before, the Prophet Sallallahu sent him back with them. So he became their teacher, and he was also um, calling other people to Islam as well. So they go back, and now there's 12 of them, and there are, uh, there's 12 of them, no, the 12 of them return back with Musa ibn Umayr, and now uh, he, he stays in the house of the same man I mentioned, As'ad, his name was As'ad ibn Zawarah, he stayed in the house of, in, in, stayed in his house. 
So um, now he, they go around giving uh, giving down to people and calling people to Islam. But then one day, one day, they go on to the lands of the other tribe. So everyone who's accepted so far, they're from the Khazraj. One day they go on to the lands of the other tribe, which is called the Aus. So, so basically, everyone can see this. There were two Arab tribes in Medina at the time. There was the Khazraj and there was the Aus. And they were fighting each other. They were at war with each other. And in fact, just before this, a very, a very big war took place. And in this war, in this war, almost all of the senior leaders of Medina were killed. This was, a, this was the war of Bu'ath. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, the battle, the war of Bu'ath was a gift which Allah gave to the Prophet sallallahu In what sense? Because almost every single senior leader was killed, and now there only remained the younger generation, the younger people. And generally speaking, the younger people were more willing to accept something new and to change. The older people, they just wanted to stick on the ways of their fathers. And also the younger people, they were fed up with all the killing and all the, all the you know, all, they were fed up with this war. And they were, they were looking for some, they were looking for peace and they were looking for some way of, you know, resolving things. So now, when they, when they hear the Prophet is, is, when they hear about the Prophet they're, they're more than willing to take him because they, they think, you know, he, he is the solution. He is, he's the one who will be able to establish peace in Medina. Oh, that's one reason anyway. However, actually not every single, the, almost every leader except one of the senior leaders of, of Medina was killed. Um, and uh, the one who remained was Ibn Ubay, Abdullah ibn Ubay. Does anyone know who Abdullah ibn Ubay is? Yeah. Chief Munafiq. Yes, exactly, the Chief Munafiq. So Ibn Ubay, he's the only senior leader remaining. Do you give one point for the... Uh... Uh, no, unfortunately not. When it says quiz on the board, you, you will start counting the points. Uh, so, so Ibn Ubay, he was, the, he was the only senior leader remaining. So he thought, okay, look, everyone else has been killed. I'm the only, you know, uh, experienced leader remaining. And he was from the Khazraj, but he was well respected in the Aus as well. So he thought, alright, that's it, I'm going to become the king of Medina. Then the Prophet ﷺ comes, and obviously that doesn't take place, which is why Ibn Ubay, he, hate, he, you know, he, hated, he hated the Prophet Islam, he hated Islam, and he never sincerely accepted Islam. And as was mentioned, he became the leader of the hypocrites. Okay, so what happens is, uh, they go to the lands, so they, so, uh, they were from, uh, so most of the people who have accepted so far from the Khazraj, right? So they go to the lands of the Aus, and they're preaching to people over there. Specifically in the, uh, the lands of the Banu uh, Abdul Ash'al, which was one of the clans of the Aus. And, uh, someone, and one, of the, one of the main leaders, his name is Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, he sees them. And he thinks, you know, what are these people coming here to our place with this new religion for? And misguiding all the weak people in our, in our uh, community. And he, he wants to chase them away. But he can't, but, he, but what, what the problem was, As'ad, this As'ad who was the one who was hosting Mus'ad ibn Umayr, he was his cousin. Uh, now you might wonder how can they be cousins when uh, one's from the Khazraj, one's from the Aus. Well, they were maternal cousins, so uh, they were related through their mothers. So because of that, it was a bit awkward for Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad to go and chase him away himself. So he said to someone else who was next to him, Usayd ibn Khudayr, who was basically, you could say he's the second in command. He said to him, go and deal with them. So Usayd ibn Khudayr, he goes to them with, the, with his weapons ready to uh, kick them out. And when uh, As'ad sees them coming, he says to uh, Mus'ad, see this man who's coming, he is very important. So if he accepts Islam, so many people will follow him. So when he comes to them, uh, he comes to them with his weapons and he says, you know, you better get out quickly or I'll kill you. So Mus'ad ibn, uh, Mus'ad ibn Umar, he said, you know, hold on, wait a minute. Why don't you just sit down and listen to what I have to say. And if you like it, you accept it. If you dislike it, I'll leave. So he said, yeah, fair enough. So he sat down and he listened to some Quran and he asked a few questions. And then he said, how do I become one of you? So he came to chase them out or even to kill them, but then he decided he wanted to accept Islam. And that's what I mean. Because these the Arab the Arab people at the time, you know, they were quite simple and you know fairly open minded. And on top of that, these people didn't have anything holding them back because they weren't and they weren't from the senior generation or anything and they weren't 
sticking to the way, sticking to um, you know, I, they weren't that adamant on sticking to idol worship and so on. They were willing to accept something new. So he accepted. And then he said, you know, the other person sitting there, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, he's the main person in this whole in this whole tribe. So if he accepts, then everyone will follow him. So he goes back to Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and he says to them, he says to him, you know your cousin, Asad, uh, such and such a group of people have decided to kill him, even though they know he's your cousin. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, he got very annoyed and said, you know, oh, do, they think, do they think they're going to, do, do they think they're going to get away with killing him? Uh, you know, of course that's not going to be allowed. And he goes over to them now. He goes over to them and he says to him, uh, you know, why are you bringing this foreign man to our place and misguiding everyone? Uh, you better get out quickly. So again, Mus'hab ibn Umair says to him, why don't you sit down and listen to what I have to say? If you like it, you accept. If you dislike it, we'll leave. So he sits down and the same thing happens. And lo and behold, because Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is the main person in this whole clan, when he accepts, pretty much everyone followed him and accepted. So now there's a huge number of people in Medina who have accepted Islam. And the following year, they go back to the Prophet ﷺ and they meet him in the, in the Hajj and they meet him in the night and there are around 70 men and there were two women, 70 men and two women. Uh, one of these women, her name was Asma bin Ta'am. Uh, does anyone, would anyone like to guess who the, who the other woman was? Nusayba, yes exactly. The other woman, the other woman was Nusayba. So they, they meet with the Prophet and they invite him to come and... Yeah? Two points. Two points. Okay, mashallah. The, the brothers are already way, way ahead. Okay, so... Oh, just be careful. That, that, that could talk. Dina. Dina. Um, so... So now... They, they go to the Prophet and they invite him to come over to, to Medina and live with them in Medina. And he is willing to agree on the condition that they will protect him as they protect their own women and children. He, uh, as they protect their own women and children. And they asked, okay, well if we're going to do that, what do we get in return? What are we going to get in return? And the Prophet said, he said one word, Al-Jannah. And that was enough to convince them. He said, okay, that's, that's, more than, that's, more than, uh, that's more than a bargain for us. But then there was one other thing, one person wanted to ask. He asked, will he asked, you know, you're, you're, going, you're coming to live with us now, but if Allah, if not if, when Allah gives you victory over your enemies here in Makkah, who are chasing you out, will you return to Makkah? And the Prophet said, no, I will remain with you in Medina. And when the time came, eight or nine years later, the Prophet comes back to Makkah with a 10,000 strong army, and he takes over Makkah. Uh, and the Ansar then, they were worried, and they were thinking, you know, he might stay here now. And he heard about this and he said, uh, he said, no, but, uh, Allah, ya al-Ansar, no, uh, all, all people of the Ansar. And he said, Al-Mahya al-Hiyakum, al mamatu mamatukum. Uh, life is with you, and death is with you. So, and he went back to uh, Medina and he stayed with them. He stayed with the Ansar in, in Medina. So now, these, these two things have been answered, and they're all ready to come and, to come and, uh, to come and give, the, give the Prophet the guarantee that they'll protect him. But then the same, this uh, As'ad, uh, the same one was hosting Mus'ab al Umair, he put his hand on the hand of the Prophet and he said, wait, now why would he do that? Because, uh, and it shows he was actually thinking, uh, his, he was very intelligent in that he was thinking, because these, these people have already accepted Islam, right? They're all Muslims already. But on top of that now, they want the Prophet to come and live with them. So he said to them, do you realize what you're doing? You're basically declaring war, because Undoubtedly, people will come to Medina to try and get rid of the Prophet and you are not going to have any peace. So it's not that he didn't want the Prophet to come, but he was concerned that his own people won't be able to, won't be able to uh, live up to what they're, what, they're, what they're pledging towards. And he said, unless you're very, if, he said, if you're not sure about it, then now's your last chance to pull out and maybe Allah will still forgive you because after all, they are Muslim. Um, but then on top of that, they want the Prophet to come to Medina. But if the Prophet comes to Medina, after they guarantee they're going to protect him, and then they don't live up to that, then they will be then they will be sinful. So he wanted to make sure of that. And they said they by now they were all fully convinced, and they pushed him aside, and they all gave the prophet the oath of allegiance. So then the prophet began his migration his migration to Medina, and uh, and so no, so they returned back to Medina, and now Nuseiba, Nuseiba, who took the oath of allegiance, she goes. And she starts teaching all the other women in Medina because now she's met the Prophet. She's met the Prophet, so she goes and she becomes a teacher in Medina. 
And then one by one people start emigrating to Medina. And the day the Prophet comes, everyone's very excited. Uh, you know, they're all out there looking for him. But he got, he got, uh, well maybe let's say he got a bit delayed. He wasn't, he didn't arrive when they expect, they were, they were thinking he would arrive sooner. But then they were waiting and waiting and they couldn't, they couldn't uh, see him. And it became very hot. And it said, um, it said that Nusayba, you know, most of the men were waiting out there. They all went back indoors into Medina because it became too hot for them. Um, but it said that Nusayba, she was one of the only people who she remained out there on the outskirts of Medina looking out for the Prophet, waiting for him to come. And eventually the Prophet did come and everyone became very happy. So Nusayba herself, who actually was she? Um, Nusayba, she, uh, she was from the Banu Najjar. So the Banu Najjar here is the, so the same, he's from there as well. Nusayba was from the Banu Najjar and they were related to the Prophet through the Prophet's mother. So the Prophet's mother, she had, she was, uh, she, um, one of her, her parents was from the Banu Najjar in, in, in Medina. Um, and Nusayba, she had two sons. Uh, and then these two sons are very important. One of them, his name was uh, Habib ibn Zayd and the other was Abdullah ibn Zayd. And Abdullah ibn Zayd, he is the one who narrated, or he's the one who demonstrated. Um, so here's a hadith that once somebody asked Abdullah ibn Zayd to show, to show him how the Prophet made wudu. So this hadith on how the Prophet made wudu, it goes back to Abdullah ibn Zayd, the son of, one of the sons of Nusaybah. She had those, uh, she had more children, but the two most important ones we need to remember were, were um, Habib and Abdullah. Uh, Nusayba, she was known as, as Umm Imara. This was her kunya. Now in Arabic, in Arabic, uh, if someone's older than you, it's very, it's, 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 uh, it's not, it's, um, it's just not done. It's very bad to call them by their real name. So especially if someone's, if someone's older, if, well, if someone is older than you. Or just out of respect, you can, um, you won't call them by their real name, you call them by their title or by their kunya. The kunya is, it will either be Abu, Abu something or Um something. Um, I don't know if this kind of thing, I don't think this is, exists in English, but in some other languages, I think this same idea exists. So for example, in Urdu, I think if, um, if someone's older than you, uh, or say if his name is uh, Muhammad, you can't call him Muhammad, can you? You have to call him like Muhammad by or something like that, right? Is that, is that true or not? If he's older than you, you can't call him by his, you can't call him just by his name. And it must be a similar uh, equivalent to the women, I don't know. But, uh, so, th so that's what it was. In Arabic, someone's older than you, you don't call them by their, by their real name. So Nusayba, uh, or even, even out of respect, you can just call them by their kunya. So Nusayba, she was addressed as Umm Imara. And, um, I mean, I'm just mentioning this, so I, and sometimes it even comes in the, in the, in, in books as well. The narrators, out of respect, they will say, they, they will mention them by the kunya. So for example, in some books they will say, Umm Imara fa'alat kada wa kada. That doesn't mean that's her name. Her name is Nusayba, but she was known as Umm Imara. So I'm just saying this just so that we know, um, you know, when we read Abu Bakr, uh, Abu Dhar, Abu Huraira, uh, Umm uh, um Imara, Umm Salama, uh, they all have, their own names, but then out of respect they would be addressed by using these uh, kunyas. Now of course, um, this is for people who are um, addressing them, not for themselves to go and call them by their, not for themselves to, to um, call themselves by their kunya. So for example, I mean even in Urdu, I think, um, like if, if you go and ask someone what, what, what's your name? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think they would say my name is Muhammad Bai or something like that, right? Um, so likewise in Arabic, uh, someone would look very foolish if they go and call themselves by their kunya. Um, uh, but then now, now uh, especially when non-Arabs use it, so then sometimes they call themselves by their kunya. So for example, you go and ask someone, what's your name? And they'll say, I'm Abu Abdullah or something like that, um, or, or Abu Abdullah or something. Um, that's not the way that the Arab people uh, used to use it. Uh, because you don't want to know what, the, what their son's name is or what their daughter's name is, you want to know what their name is. Um, but of course, uh, if, you, if, you call, if you're called Abu Bakr, for example, then that means your name after Abu Bakr, that's not your kunya, that's your actual name. So now if anyone knows, if anyone knows uh, somebody called Abu Bakr, don't go and tell them that, or Ibrahim said that it's very bad manners to call yourself Abu Bakr. Because that's not, that's the actual name, that's not uh, kunya. Anyway, I don't know why I went with this, but... 
Um, let me see what's next. Okay, so what, what we really see what Umm Imar was about in the Battle of Uthud. So in the Battle of Uthud, um, yes. So in the Battle of Uthud, uh, the prophets, the Muslims were originally initially the Muslims were winning, but then what happened is so the Prophet ﷺ had placed some archers on the mountain because he wanted to protect their back, so they could be attacked from the rear if. Um, by by the by the horsemen from the other from the enemy side from Mecca, so the Prophet placed some archers on a mountain, and he said, "Even if you see some birds coming and plucking us uh, plucking us out of thin air, don't um, leave your position. Stay on this mountain and protect our rear." What happened is the Muslims were winning. The archers go down the mountain uh, to to collect the, to collect the spoils of war, whatever's left behind. They went down the mountain, they disobeyed the command of uh, the Prophet and the Meccan horsemen came round the back and they ambushed the Muslims from the rear and it became a, uh, it became a uh, catastrophe and the Prophet himself became in, was injured and, you know, in, in more than one way and blood was pouring down his face and the Prophet said, how will a people be successful when they, when they injure their messenger in this manner, when all he is doing is calling his people to, uh, to Allah, to their Lord. And it became a very tense situation. So these people, they are all chasing after the Prophet, and um, uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ was retreating to a mountain, and they're all, the, the horsemen are coming behind them, and a small group of people are with the Prophet, and the Prophet was saying to them, who will go and, and divert these people and for him he will be my companion in paradise. It was a very, it was that that's how tense the situation was. So one by one people will be going and fighting them and at least delaying them so to give the, the Prophet more time to retreat. Um, and Musaiba, when the, she went along originally, she went along with the army to look after the injured people, to take care of the injured people. But when the battle the, the, the battle the tide of the battle turned Musaiba herself, she pulled out her sword and she took her bow and arrow and she went and she stood in front of the Prophet and she, and she began to protect him. And the Prophet himself said, um, uh, I didn't turn to the right or to the left or look in front except that I saw Musaiba bin Ka'ab standing there and defending me from people. And there's an example of, for example, and she herself said, they were all on horses, they were coming on horses. She said, if they'd been on foot, We'd have killed all of them, but because they were on horses, it was more difficult. And for example, one man he came, and he uh, and he was on the horse. She struck the legs of the horse, and the man fell off the horse, and then she finished him off. Uh, and not just her, but also her her husband and both of her sons. They were also standing there protecting the Prophet And one of her sons, he got injured very badly, and blood was pouring out of his out of his arm. And she went to him. And she just wrapped up this wound and she told him to carry on fighting. And the Prophet ﷺ said, From where can anyone get courage like yours, O uh, Umm Imara, or, or the Sayyid Abid Ka? You know, it was, it was unimaginable that a woman um, fighting, in the, fighting in the war would be able to do such, um, do such things. And, uh, then what, and then what happened is, the same, the same guy, the same guy later on, he was coming. They saw him coming to attack the Prophet So Nusayba, she jumped in front of the Prophet and, she, um, and she, she took her sword and she gave him such a heavy blow that he fell flat on his face and then she killed him as well. The same one who injured her, her own son. Um, and you know, eventually and the Prophet Sallallahu he was, uh, you know, the Prophet uh, of course survived this battle. But well, this battle was a very, this battle was tragic in that many of the companions were killed in this battle. We know that Hamza was Hamza was killed. Hamza of Allah. And on top of that, uh, Mus'hab ibn Umayr, the same I mentioned, the same one I mentioned before, the first man to come to Medina and call all the people to Islam, he was killed in a very brutal manner. And when they tried when they tried to bury him, when they tried to bury Mus'hab ibn Umayr, and remember he was the richest person, he was from the richest family in Mecca, and he had been the best dressed person in Mecca. Wherever anyone would go, they wouldn't see anyone looking like Mus'hab ibn Umayr. But now, 
after he's, uh, he's been killed in Uhud, the companions that came to the Prophet and they said we couldn't find anything of his to bury him with. We couldn't find anything of his to bury him with, um, except one uh, one uh, sheet, one one big uh, piece piece of cloth. And if we cover his upper body with it, his lower body is exposed. If we cover his lower body, his upper body is exposed. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, cover his upper body with it and use the leaves of a certain tree to cover his lower body. But the point being, we see that he, he, at the beginning he was, he was one of the richest and then he accepts Islam and everything changes. And when he passes away, they can't even find enough uh, material to, to bury him with. Uh, and uh, more, but apart from that, most of the people who were killed in Uhud were from the Ansar. And the Prophet Sallallahu he was he cared, the Prophet was very upset about this because he cared a lot about the Ansar, the people of Medina, the people who had agreed to take him in and protect him as they protect their own women and children. And the Prophet Sallallahu actually said many things in, in support of the Ansar. For example, as I said, as I mentioned, when the Prophet returned to Mecca um, right at the end with a big army and he took over Mecca and the Ansar were worried that he would remain in Mecca. The Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, you know, uh, life is with you and death is with you. And then he said, if, if all of humanity were to take one path and the Ansar were to take another path, I would take the path of the Ansar. And before the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he returned to the he returned to Uhud and he went to visit the graves of the of the Shuhada of Uhud and he made a special dua for them. And he said, I will testify in front of Allah for you. So this Uhud was was a tragic uh, was a tragic occasion, and many people many people were killed. When the when the army was returning to um, to Mecca, then it turned then they realized actually what, what, like we haven't even finished the, we haven't even killed uh, the prophet yet. There is uh, a rumor spread that they were going to return back to try and kill the prophet the, the the army who was going back to Mecca, they were going to come back to fight again. So the prophet immediately sent out. Uh, a, um, a force to fight them, and uh, um, the Saber she wanted to be part of this of this of this army. She wanted to go with them, but the Saber she was injured very badly. For one thing, she had been standing in front of the Prophet uh, well, One man called someone called Ibn Qamia. He came to try and kill the Prophet The Saber went and stood in front of him, and his sword struck her shoulder very badly. And because of that, uh, this, this, this single wound, it took a whole year to heal. And in fact, it required, uh, uh, the, the healing process required uh, cauterization. And she actually said later on that the process of healing was more painful than the wound itself. Uh, but it was, it was necessary to stop the bleeding. And not just that, not just that one which took a whole year to heal, she had 12 other injuries as well. But in spite of that, the same by saying she wants to go, go out with this force to go and fight these people and stop them returning to Prophet Sallallahu But uh, she just was unable to because of all of these wounds. She was unable to, but she, even though she wanted to. Um, so as it turned out, when this force went out to, to, uh, to, to, in, to fight those people returning, they all fled. They went back to Makkah. They fled back to Makkah. Okay, so um, another thing we know about uh, um, another thing we know about um, Nusayba is that once uh, this is related to the Quran. So in the Quran, uh, the normally, often, quite often, the the masculine uh, uh, the, the masculine uh, plural uh, pronoun is used to dis for both the male and the female. So, for example, um, in uh, one of, in Surah Tahrim, Allah says, "Wamariyam, uh, Wamariyam التي أحصنت فرجها اتصور مريم عليه عليه السلام على أن أن يسأل وكانت من القانتين and she was from the the ones who were very devout and القانتين القانتين is is the is the masculine is the is the male plural in Arabic القانتين or القانتون is the male plural but it includes both men and women uh, and this comes in other places as well for example the prophet said طلب العين فريضة على كل مسلم Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, but this means both the male and the female, even though it, it, it says Muslim, which is which is the male. Um, so Um uh, Nusayba, she went to Um Salama. Does anyone know who Um Salama is? Who's Um Salama? Why did the Prophet 
Mashallah, they're three and a half. I, I can't. Sisters aren't going to catch up with this. Okay. Uh, so she went to Umm Salama and she said, you know, what's 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 the matter with us uh, women that the, the men are being mentioned so much in the Quran, but we are not mentioned much at all. So Umm Salama, and this was this was not just this was not just her, by the way. Many other people were, were thinking this as well. But she went and and she mentioned this to Umm Salama. Umm Salama mentioned it to the Prophet Sallallahu and then one of the next revelation, one of the next revelations which came down was uh, Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimati wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minati wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitati wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqati wal-Khashaina wal-Khashaati and it just keeps going and it's mentioning both the male plural and the female plural uh, so this was uh, uh, something interesting which and uh, we'll say about she's the one who first, uh, first asked about this So Nusayba, as I mentioned, she attended Uhud, then she attended uh, the Bay'atul Ridwan, and then she attended um, uh, Khaybar, then she attended Hunayn, she attended so many uh, important battles and she was, defending, uh, she was fighting for the Prophet in all of these different battles. Um, towards the end of the Prophet's life, so now what happened in Arabia, most people have never heard of this thing called prophethood. But then uh, the Prophet comes and he and he um, Prophet comes and he uh, you know he, he, he declares that he's a prophet and many people over time eventually follow him. So now with all those other all the other all the powerful you know rich or, or politically powerful people in Arabia, they're looking at him and saying, Well look, he's he's become a prophet and then he he and then he well over time eventually he, he becomes, you know, Muslim Islam spreads all everywhere and he becomes he he gets power. So now they're all thinking, you know what, why don't we try it as well? So uh, does anyone know who's the most um, who's the most famous of this this lot of people? Yeah yeah? Musaylama, yes. Musaylama. <laughs> Musaylama was from Oh you can't see it. Can anyone see that? No, it's okay. very black. Yes. <laughs> okay, no problem. Musaylama was from the was from the Banu Hanifa, and they were in the province of Yamama. So that was um, east of that was east of Medina, and it was a huge area. So Musaylama, um, he actually, in fact, Musaylama, he had gone to. So uh, most of the most of the false prophets, they had no idea what prophet was, and then. Suddenly they decide, okay, we're going to become prophets. Musaylama was actually a bit different. Musaylama had gone to Rome, um, and he had spent time there, and he had, uh, he had, or was it Rome? Or I think it was Jerus um, Jerusalem. And he had spent time there, and he had learned Latin, and he had become very, um, very much acquainted with this whole idea of prophets and, 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 and everything in Christianity and so on. And he found out that a prophet is about to come to Arabia. So he, so he knows the prophet's coming in this time. Okay, I'm living in this time. Perfect. The prophet's coming in Arabia. Yes, I'm, I'm an Arab as well. I'm from Arabia. So, and the prophet's, you know, the prophet's going to, um, uh, yeah, the prophet's going to come in this time. So he ticked, he ticked all the boxes and he decided, okay, perfect. I'll be the prophet. So he, he was just, he, he decided, Musayyama had decided he's going to be the prophet. Now all he needed was for Jibreel Alayhi to come to him and give him revelation. He was just waiting for that, but he was, he was sure it would come soon. And then what happened? The Prophet Sallallahu received revelation and the Prophet Sallallahu became the Prophet. And Musaylam was obviously not, not that pleased is he now, because he thought he was going to be the Prophet. And in fact, he was sure he'd be the Prophet. And because when he, and when he returned as well, when he returned, uh, he returned to his place in Yamama, um, which is where he was from Banu Hanifa, he was from Banu Hanifa in Yamama. He returned there, and people were so impressed with him, they would call him Rahmanul Yamama, which means uh, the, the merciful, the most merciful one of, of Yamama. He, everyone, everyone loved Musaylam in, from, his, from his tribe. Um, so then Musaylam, what happened is he came and he met the Prophet and he said to him, uh, um, he said, so he said, to, he said to the Prophet Sallallahu that I, uh, uh, I, have, I will follow you on the condition that you make me a prophet like Musa made Harun a prophet. 
So I'll, I'll, like, don't worry, I'll, I'll follow you, but you have to name me a prophet first, then I'll follow you. So Prophet ﷺ, he picked up a twig and he said, by Allah, I won't even share this twig with you. Never mind, I'm not going, of course I'm not going to make you a prophet. So Abu Sayyidah, he goes back to, um, back to, uh, back to Yamama, and now he sends, the, he sends the Prophet a message, and in it he says, uh, he says, uh, from uh, min uh, min Musaylamata Rasulillah. So he's already decided he's the messenger. Ila Muhammad Rasulillah. And then he says, Inni qad ushrik tu ma'aka fil am. I have been I have been made. Allah has given me a share. Allah has given me a share of prophethood with you. Allah has made me share in prophethood with you. So he says, فَإِذَا وَصَلَ كَتِسَابِ هَذَا When this message of mine comes to you. Uh, Split the earth into two into two parts. I'll have one part, you take the other part. So when the Prophet received this, uh, he obviously wasn't uh, he 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 um, he replied to him, he sent a message back, and in this message he wrote Min Muhammad Rasulullah ila Musaylama al Kadha. So Musaylama sent the message uh, um, signing himself off as Musaylama Rasulullah, Musaylama the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet replied إلى مسيلمة الكذاب to مسيلمة the big liar and then he said سلام على من اتبع الهدى peace be upon those who follow uh, true guidance إن الأرض لله يريدها من يشاء من عباده والعاقبة للمتقين the earth belongs to Allah and he will give it to whoever he pleases and he sent this message to مسيلمة with Habib ibn Zayd Habib ibn Zayd was the son of مسيبة بن كعب now Musaylama, when he received this message, he became very, very angry. So he took uh, Habib ibn Zayd, the son of Musayba, and he tied him up. Now this is already crossing the line. Why? Because you, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a universal law, you don't kill messengers. You don't kill messengers. Now Musaylama, he's coming here. Musaylama is coming here and claiming to be a prophet, but Never mind keeping to the keeping to the the, the, the the bare minimum, which is you don't have messengers. He's not even keeping to the bare minimum. He is falling below that because with the Prophet Sallallahu for example, in Badr, in Badr, there the, were the prisoners of war, and the Prophet treated them better than anyone could possibly imagine. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always went above that, above and beyond everyone else's standards. Musaylama here is claiming to be a prophet. He can't even he can't even maintain the bare minimum. He falls below that. He takes his messenger. And he ties him up. And he said to him, uh, he said to him, Do you testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? And he said, Yes. He said, Do you testify that I am the messenger of Allah? He said, I can't hear you. So what did Musaylama do? Musaylama ordered that one of his limbs be cut off. Musaylama, here he's got he's taken the messenger and he's tied him up, and then now he orders one of his limbs be cut off. And now, um, in in such a situation, uh, in such a situation, actually, uh, all right. So uh, Musaylama, he he's now ordered that one of his uh, one of his limbs be cut off. Then he asked again. He asked again. Do you, do you testify Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? And he says yes. And he says, do you testify I am the messenger of Allah? And now you can see this. The son of Musayba, he already knows. Now even even if the first time he didn't know what would happen. Now he already knows, he already cut maybe his arm off or something like that. Which is quite, uh, you know, imagine, imagine anyone being in that situation. But again, he says, I can't hear you. So what does Musaylama do? Musaylama orders that to happen again. And then it happens a third time. And he, and he asks him, you testify, I am the messenger of Allah. And he said, I testify that you are Musaylama al kathab You are the Musaylama, the big liar. And Musaylama did it again. And this kept happening until eventually he died. Uh, because you know he's, he keeps on cutting, he, he was chopped up into pieces literally, and you know no, now normally they say um, you know it's no coincidence that he's the son of Musaiba. Normally they say like father like son, but in this case maybe more like mother like son because this was just like Musaiba, just like his mother. His mother was his mother was uh, as the prophet said he didn't know where anyone would find courage like the courage Musaiba had. And she was absolutely fearless. And here we see her son in such a situation. And by the way, when someone's in such a situation, 
as long as they sincerely believe in their heart, they will be allowed outwardly to say something to divert the, the torture. Um, and it says in the Quran, As long as in their heart they are believing, they will be allowed to say something to, di to divert it away. But still the one who, who, who remains firm both inwardly and outwardly will be better than one who, one who gives in outwardly just to, uh, just to get away from the punishment, even though, even though they still believe. And, and as we can see here, Hadith ibn Zayd didn't budge even one bit, both on the inside and on the outside. So Musayr al he's, he's done this. He's, he's killed the he's killed the son of um, he's killed the son of uh, of Nusayba. Uh, of Nusayba. And Nusayba, when she heard this, she said, uh, "Well, she said, you know, I will be patient, and I will uh, and I will expect reward uh, with Allah." And she also said, "It was for something like this that he was he was prepared and brought up for, because he was a young boy." He was a very small boy at the at the uh, at the pledge of allegiance when she was there with the seventy men and the other woman. She, uh, her, her son was there with her as well, and he pledged allegiance to Prophet as well as a young boy. And now, when he's older, he's been killed uh, fighting to uh, to defend the, the message of the Prophet um, And but of course, at the same time, like any mother, she will be upset when her son has been killed like this. And to say, but she wasn't. Uh, she was, uh, Nusayba wasn't any average mother. Nusayba, she said, but if I get my hands, if I get anywhere near Nusayba, his neck will not be free from my sword and I will make his daughters cry over him. So she was already planning to, planning to, um, planning to fight Nusayba. And later on when the Muslims went to fight him, she went out with the army as well, as we'll get to. Now Musaylama himself, um, Musaylama, he actually had some interesting, interesting uh, revelation, or what he claimed to be revelation. And one of these, for example, he um, he claimed he claimed to re receive uh, Quran. And Amr ibn al-As, one of the companions of the Prophet, he um, he he met Musaylama before he became Muslim. Amr ibn al-As, he was not a Muslim yet. He met Musaylama. And uh, Musaylam asked, what has been revealed to Muhammad, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And Amr ibn al said, a short, concise and um, eloquent surah has been revealed to him. He said, what is it? He said, وَلَعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُصْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّوْرِ So uh, Musaylam, he said, yeah, I received a revelation too. So Amr ibn al he said, what is it? Musaylama said, Ya wadar, ya wadar, laka udhunani wa sadr wa aqiruka haqqun wa naqar. So, so, uh, and he, so he's, he's speaking to a, you can't really see it, but it's basically, uh, I think in English it's called a high rats. So the wadar is, is something like uh, one of the small animals, basically. So he says, uh, he's speaking to that and he says, you have two ears and a chest and the rest of you is despised and empty. So he said to he said to Amr ibn al-As, what do you think? So Amr ibn al-As said, By Allah, he said, Wallahi inna ka ta'lam anni a'lam anna ka kathab. By Allah, you know that I know that you are a big liar. So, uh, so Musaylama was a bit you know, disappointed with this. And actually, all of Musaylama's surahs, he, they were copying the, the Quran and the, the surahs of the Prophet So for example, he heard that the Prophet ﷺ had Surah al -Fil. And he said, yeah, don't worry, I've got Surah al as well. I've got my own Surah al So he, he was asked, so, so then he said, uh, al fil the elephant. Mal fil what is the elephant? Wa ma adwaka mal fil And what will make you know what is the elephant? Lahu, uh, lahu khurpoon tawil. It has a long trunk, wa zaylun qasir, and a short tail. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> so, um, and then there was another, there was another one as well. Um, he said once Musaylama he said, "Wazari'ati zara'at al-hasidati hafda fala fatahinati tahna wal khabizati khabza wal akilati akla." He said, uh, "So now does anyone know which surah this is? This is copying. Can anyone guess? Yeah. Ah, uh, it could be Nazi'at. Yeah." Yeah, it could be it could be as well. Yeah, it could be it could be any of those. So you basically copy. Could be Mursalat as well. You're right. Yeah, good point. 
I only thought of one of them. You guys have thought of many. So he is copying the copying the Quran. So what does this mean? This means um, by the by the farmers who who plant, by the planters who plant, and the harvesters who harvest, and the um, and the grinders who grind. You know what the grinding mill? They grind grind the wheat, and the bakers who bake when they bake the bread, and the eaters who eat uh, when they you know now they're eating the bread. Um, so some people said to him. Some people said to him, you know, the Quran and the Prophet it was revealed to his heart. But with you, we don't really know whether your Quran, it's hard to tell whether your Quran was revealed to your heart or to your stomach, because you're always talking about food. So, um, and then he goes on to say, um, and then Musaylama went on to say, uh, uh, so after all this, after all this perfect, nice, nicely grinding stuff, he went on to say, "Lana nisqul arb, wali Qurayshin nisqul arb, walakin Qurayshin qawmun la yadilu." So his, his his rhyme kind of went out the window. He said, "So after all this stuff about the the planting uh, planting the planting the wheat and harvesting it and and grinding it and making the bread and eating the bread," he said, "He's swearing by all of that." He said, "We are half of the earth and Quraysh are half of the earth." But Quraysh are people who aren't very fair. So I mean, this is this is another reason why this was one of this was the way that it was all about tribalism. It was it was all about uh, the tribalism and people would it depended on everyone. It was one for all and one for all one for all and all for one when it came to a tribe. And people would lineage would be very important as well because of this lineage was everything. So people would remember. People would you go to any average Arab at that time and they would be list off to you. Ten generations back of all their ancestors. Uh, I mean, for example, like me, I can, I, maybe I know, I know my grand, I know my grandparents' name, uh, names. Maybe my, uh, one of my great grandfather's name, and that's about it. But these people, they were able to list off the whole thing. Why? Because it's all about tribalism. So now Musayyama is using the same tactic to try and get people to follow him. He's saying that he doesn't realize it's, it's not about tribes and 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 things like that. It's about uh, the, the message of Islam. The Prophet comes as a prophet to everyone. He said, "We, the Banu Hanifa, we have half of the earth, and the Quraysh will have half of the earth, and but the Quraysh are people who aren't very fair." And actually, one old man, uh, they went to him and they asked him, "You know, do you?" He was used from Banu Hanifa and his father Musaylam. They said, they asked him, "Do you really believe in what this Musaylam has said? You know, by the eaters who eat and by the you know all that stuff?" And he said, "No, I know he's lying." So they said, "Okay, why are you believing him then?" He said, and he said, the big liar of Banu Hanifa, my tribe, is more beloved to me than the truthful person from Quraysh. So this is this is what they this is the way they some of these people thought. It was all about their tribe and getting um, getting everything for their tribe. They didn't care about um, no, like there's no no thought about the, the day of judgment or anything like that. It was all in this world we have our, our, our tribe being the, the most uh, the most powerful. Um, and Musaylam, he actually said, uh, you know how they used to call him Muhammad al Yamama. He actually said, he actually said that he, Musaylam, he said, you know Muhammad, he actually, uh, he actually speaks about me as well in a positive way. And they said, what do you mean? He calls you Musaylam al Kadha, the big Musaylam al Bidda. And he said, no, don't you know Mus uh, Muhammad says, Bismillah al Rahman al Rahim, and I am Muhammad. So Mu Muhammad is is talking about me here. So you know, Musa al uh, is a deluded guy. Uh, but anyway, um, so and Musa al he wouldn't have been followed that much if not for one other person. Um, <coughs> his name was uh, his name was. Uh, so there was a man called Nahar Rajal. He was from the Banu Hanifa, but he had accepted Islam. <coughs> he had accepted Islam um, during the time of the Prophet. When all this stuff happened with Musaylam, he decided to go over there and call people back to Islam. But at this time, this man he didn't have much knowledge. This Nahar, this guy called Nahar Rajal, uh, Nahar Rajal, he didn't have much knowledge at all. He just accepted Islam. He went back to his people in Banu Hanifa to try and convince them to accept Islam, to try and convince them to, to return back to Islam. Um, then what happened to him? 
he because he he tried he went there and he realized there were so many of them people there, there were so many people following Musaylama and he sort of argued with some of them and they convinced him and then he turned over to Musaylama's side. So he went there for one thing and he turned over to Musaylama's side. And the Prophet actually predicted this um, predicted the coming of this man once he was in a gathering. Um, and Abu Huraira narrates, he, Abu Huraira was in a gathering <coughs> with some other people and this man, he was part of this gathering. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Among you is somebody whose, whose one of his teeth alone, one of his teeth in the hellfire is bigger than the mountain of Qutb. So just one of his teeth. So that's how bad this person is. One of his, te one of his teeth in, 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 in hellfire is as, is, is as big as a mountain. And uh, Abu Huraira, he says, uh, Abu Huraira, he kept track of all the people who were in that gathering at the time who the Prophet addressed, and he says, every single one of them died on Islam, except uh, the only, only remaining was me and this other guy, this, uh, this Rajal. Um, but then what happened is he defected over to Musaylama and he became a, he, he, and he apostated. So now this guy he became even more dangerous and even more deceptive, even even more of a problem than Musaylama himself. Now why would that be? Does anyone know why why is he going to be more of a problem than Musaylama himself? Yeah, walk it out. Siraj, you can hand up. Not the war plans, no, uh, but good try. Uh, anybody else? Yeah? He knows how to ambush the prophet. Not that either, it's similar, but not, not that either. Good try. Anything else? So basically, what it is is he spent time with the prophet and now he goes back to the Banu Hanifa and he accepts, he, acts, he, he, he turns over to them, he accepts Musaylam as a prophet. And then what does he do? He now starts claiming that the Prophet said that Musaylama uh, said, said that Musaylama is also a prophet, and he spent time and he and he was with the Prophet just before that. So now everyone thinks that okay, he's going to be telling the truth, um, and everyone followed him now. So he started deceiving people because people who didn't yet believe in Musaylama, now this guy comes from the Prophet and he tells everyone that Muhammad has said that Musaylama is also a prophet. So now people start following Musaylama. Um, so as I said, there were there were there were, Musayla wasn't the only one. There were others as well. There were there was um, there was even one female who claimed to be a prophet uh, or prophetess, um, and her name was uh, her name was uh, Sajja. She claimed to be a prophet. She claimed to be a prophet as well. Uh, and what happened is um, she actually well, I'm not, she actually ended up uh, she actually ended up marrying Musayla. Um, in order that, um, in order that uh, they they join their forces and attack the Muslims, so she actually ended up marrying Musaylama, this other one who's also a false prophet. And her people said to her, said to Musaylama, yeah, uh, "You just married her. What are you going to give her as a dowry? What's her maha going to be?" So Musaylama, he had a good thing, and then he said, uh, "He said, you know, you know what? Um, your dowry, her dowry will be." What I'm going to gift you with is I'm going to lift Fajr and Aisha. So uh, you used you, you used to be praying uh, all five prayers. Now the dowry for her is that her people no longer have to pray Fajr and Aisha. This was Musaylama's uh, Musaylama's uh, dowry for this uh, for this person. Um, and I mean the Prophet said that the, the most difficult prayer for the for the hypocrites to attend is Fajr and Aisha. Um, so these people. No, don't forget, they were still praying. So these people, they were still praying, and they still believed that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't deny he was a prophet, but they were also claiming someone else is a prophet, and that is that is disbelief. So they were they were disbelieving now, even though they were, they were still praying. So now, but then, but then Musaylam has come and said, "Don't worry, no Fajr, no Aisha. You only have to pray the other three. And this was actually another of these false people. Uh, his name was Kuleyka. He, um, he. Uh, he came to his people and he said, "You know, I got some great news. Allah gave me Allah gave me a great gift for me to give to all of you, and that is, we remove um, we remove the the ruku and the sujood in the prayer. So you no longer need to do ruku or sujood. So these are the kind of 
gifts that these people give me the people. It reminds me of um, that man who came in, who recently he came in India and he claimed to be a prophet. So as he claimed to be, step by step he claimed to be different things, he eventually claimed to be a prophet. And he would write different stuff um, in different languages and his, his English was terrible, every language was terrible, his Arabic was the worst. His Arabic was by far the worst. And people came to him and said, look at this stuff you're writing, it's not, it's, it's grammatically incorrect. So this guy, he said, don't worry, one of the miracles which Allah has given me is that he lifted the Arabic grammar from us. So we no longer need, no longer need any Arabic grammar. So just like, just like, just like him, Musaylama, he said, uh, we no longer need to pray, uh, Fajr and Aisha. These are all the great miracles these people are coming with. So anyway, what happened is, um, what happened is, Musa, um, the okay. So uh, um, uh, the, the Muslims went out to fight Musaylama, and the Prophet uh, and no, the Pro this was after the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. In the time of Abu Bakr, the Muslims went to fight this guy Musaylama, and uh, Musaylama bin Kaab, she went with the army. So she's, she's, um, she's a woman, but she went with the army with the intention to fight. And even when they got there, people were telling her, you know, why don't you stay with the women and attend to the sick and so on? You don't need to fight in the battle. But she said, I've not come all this way just to sit on the side and attend to the sick people. I'm actually going to fight and I'm going to kill Musaylama myself. Um, so she actually did take part in the battle. And it was a very, um, it was a very difficult battle, but eventually, all the people, all, um, all their leaders were killed. This this guy who, who this guy who apostated Bajjal, he was killed. All the other leaders were killed. Musaylama himself, uh, Wakshi, threw his spear at him. Does anyone know who Wakshi is? Yeah. The same one who killed. Yeah, the same one who killed Hamza. He now with the same spear he threw it at Musaylama. And then Abdullah ibn Zayd. Does anyone remember who Abdullah ibn Zayd is? Yes. yes. Yeah, the other son, exactly. It's the other son of Musaiba. He, Abdullah ibn Zayd, he's the one who finished Musaiba off. He, he, um, he um, killed Musaiba. And this was, um, you know, this was a big, uh, big success for the Muslims. But at the same time, it was a very difficult battle and many, many of the Muslims were killed in this battle. But, and Musaiba herself, she fought a very brave fight. But in the, and she killed many people and she, you know, she uh, impressed everyone with her fighting. And many people heard about her as well from this battle. But Musaiba herself, she lost her arm in this battle. She lost one of her arms in this battle. But um, uh, and Musa well then afterwards, um, yeah, she lost her arm in this battle, but she lived on afterwards. Um, and Musaiba, Yeah, so Nusayba, she went on to become a teacher of Qur'an and, uh, and a narrator of Hadith. Um, oh, and one of, the, one of the Hadith she's narrated is this one here. And the Prophet ﷺ came to her house and the Prophet said, uh, the Prophet was, uh, and she, she served food to the Prophet. Uh, excuse me, just be careful over there. Uh, but, and she served, and the Prophet said, uh, so whoever, where, if somebody is fasting and food is eaten in their presence, he said, uh, the angels send salutations upon him. Like we say, Allahumma salli ala, we don't say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. The angels do the same for the person who is fasting and then food is eaten in their presence. Because of course that's going to be very difficult for them. Uh, so remember this as well, we should all remember this. If, if we happen to be fasting and we you know, fasting on outside of Ramadan, we go to somebody's house, everyone's eating, and you're just sitting there watching everyone eating, and it's really difficult. Just remember that, you know, this is this is what you will what you will get. Okay. Um, so Nuseiba, um, she also she was very much respected by everybody, and particularly Abu Bakr and Abdullah and Umar. Abu Bakr and Umar, they both very much respected Nuseiba. And once when a, uh, some, uh, uh, a large amount of silk, a large amount of silk came from one of the other provinces, 
uh, during the time of Umar because it was from uh, maybe Yemen or one of the different provinces. They came to Medina, and of course, you know, men can't can't wear silk, so silk has to be uh, a woman. Only a woman can take this and make you know make clothes out of it for herself. So everyone was telling Umar, you know, why don't you give it to your wife? And someone said, give it to your daughter. And someone said, give it to your sister. And so on and so on. Umar said, no, I don't know if anyone is more deserving of it than Nusayba bin Ka'ab. So if all the women were there at that time, and this silk, this um, amount, this large amount of silk comes in, he said, I would give it to Nusayba bin Ka'ab because that was how much respect that Umar had for her, and how much respect everyone, everyone respected her. And Nusayba passed away during the, the time of Umar, and you know, to this day, Nusayba remains uh, an inspiration to uh, to everybody. Just a quick, uh, let me see. Okay, so just uh, a quick thing, we need to, uh, so, so maybe some lessons to learn. To learn the religion well before preaching to, to others. So this, this guy called Rajal, he was Muslim, but he was very, he didn't know, he didn't know much about the religion at all. He was, very, he was fairly ignorant, he just knew some basic stuff. And then now all these people have apostated, he said, I'm going to go and bring them all back. Um, and he went there, and as it happened, he ended up joining them. Um, and I remember there was this, um, she reminds me, there was, there was some, there was, I think, uh, I, rem I remember there used to be uh, a brother in Cambridge who, you know, he was always, he was very practicing. I don't, I don't know how, how knowledgeable he was, but he was very practicing. He would go to the mosque all the time. He would go to the mosque for Fajr, for Zohar, for, he would go to every prayer. And even, I, you know, I remember, I remember I used to see him in the mosque um, doing his university stuff and so on. He'd be doing his stuff in the mosque. And he would attend that one store and so on. Uh, and then one day, he went and he started. Uh, from, what I, from, what I, from what I heard, he went and he he went to his university professors in the in the university, and he started debating with them about about Islam. And he started he started having a debate with his university professors. And he wasn't very, as far as I know, he wasn't very knowledgeable, but he was very practicing. Uh, and then what happened is. Because he's just debating with them, they actually convinced him. And uh, what I heard is that after that, he ended up, he was actually proclaiming atheism. So this man, he was very practicing, attending every prayer in the mosque, and every, I, I remember we used to see him all the time in the mosque, and then he goes and debates with some people, and he, 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 really, he left Islam. Um, so really, it goes to show that um, the, 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 it's very important that we learn the religion well, Especially before you know, going and looking into other stuff, um, you know, uh, science and so on, and comparing it with this, comparing it with Islam and uh, you know, science and Christianity, and you know, uh, saying you know, this is better than this and so on. We should first learn our own religion properly. Um, and of course, you know, this isn't this isn't the same. The, for this, for this, for this, Raja, the, the Prophet said, uh, the Prophet said he's in the hellfire. And you know, this um, this brother, may Allah, may Allah guide him back, and may Allah guide all of us. Um, but um, it just goes to show that you know we should uh, we should learn the religion, learn the religion properly. Um, okay, try to understand what the Quran is saying. So uh, you know, Ahmad bin Al-Haus, he wasn't even Muslim, but when he heard the Quran of Musaylam, he he understood the Quran. So when he heard the Quran of Musaylam, he knew straight away that this wasn't even comparable comparable to the to the real Quran. Um, but you know, so us sometimes we read the Quran and we, you know, we, we complete all our, our khatams of it in Ramadan and so on, and we attend all the Torah and we listen to it. But we don't, uh, we don't always focus on the meaning. And actually, if you think, I, I mean, uh, I'm not going to do it now, but people have done it. If you if you take one of these other people's stuff like Musaylam's Quran and you recite it in a very nice voice, you know, people, you no know, people will tell the difference. Someone might think that's the actual Quran. Because if you don't know what it, what it means, they sound similar. If you know what it means, then there's no way you can you can confuse the two. But that's just just a point to make that you know Amr bin Al-Haus, he wasn't Muslim, but he still knew. We we need to try and learn the meaning, then we will know. Seek the truth wherever it comes from. So these people, they were all about their own tribe. You know, this guy he said, um, it's it's my my tribe and um, I'm only going to follow the guy from my tribe, even though I know he's lying, and the prophet is telling the truth. So we, we should we should realize this that you know, the it's, it's wherever the truth comes from, we should always uh, go for that. No matter where whether it comes from somebody we dislike, 
uh, we should we should uh, it shouldn't be about you know us us it should be about as I say it should be about finding out who is right it should be about finding out uh, what is right um, and you know really I think the biggest lesson the most obvious lesson from this whole story of the Saba is you know about the role that women that women play in Islam. Women have a role to play as well. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, uh, in Islam, of course, a woman can't be uh, a woman can't be a prophet. At least according to most people, a woman can't be an imam. But there's nothing to say that a woman can't become a scholar of Islam. A woman can't become, you know, a teacher of Quran. A woman can't become a um, a, uh, a narrator of hadith and there are numerous examples from the Islamic history which show that women have have always played this role now unfortunately in our time and it's not everywhere but in some places you know women are, are, are women are uh, you know not uh, women are not allowed to learn the religion for example that's one thing and you know as you know in some places there's no women's area in the mosque um, and you know this leads to many problems because I mean of course if the woman doesn't know anything the woman is the one who's bringing up the, the children. So, if the woman is not knowledgeable of Islam, then what's going to happen to the children? Which is which causes major problems in many households. And not only that, but also nobody's going to stay. Nobody's going to stay with the problem. So if the problem, they, they've got this problem that you know women are oppressed. So if if if, if, not, if, there's, if nobody finds a solution in Islam itself, they will go for other things. And now, of course. You know, feminism, fe feminism is very, very um, prevalent, and many people are, you know, people, even, even Muslims, uh, you, you're starting to get people who, who are Muslims and they become feminists as well. And feminists also attack Islam because they see Islam as, you know, Islam is this oppressive thing. Um, but the, the feminists, of course, they, um, that, that, that obviously, that doesn't work either because, um, Because that doesn't work either. Because um, because feminists say that everyone has to be equal, and basically what they want to do, so they, they want to make they want to make um, what the fem like I mean there's there's different arguments, but some but um, some of them now you know in in summary you could say that feminists basically want to make women like men, which in itself is against what they want because then they're basically saying that being a man is better than being a woman so they want to make women like men um, and also also this thing about equality equality can't equality isn't really what's going to work what you need is fairness and justice and no doubt in many you know, particularly in many islamic countries there isn't fairness women are oppressed um, but why is it what's why is it so why is it fairness and not equality because uh, you know, obviously women and men are different, so when they say, oh, we want equality, it's, uh, it's you know, that's not, that's not a solution, because, I mean, say for example, uh, let me think, um, so say for example, if, if there's somebody, and they have two, um, they have two, uh, somebody with two pets, so first he has a, a goldfish, and he keeps it in the fish tank, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not comparing uh, humans to animals, yeah, I'm just using an analogy. So he has a goldfish, he keeps it in a fish tank. Then he gets a cat. And he says, you know what, I'm not going to let anybody say that I'm, I'm unequal with my pets. So he gets a fish tank, he gets another fish tank, and he puts a cat in the fish tank. So obviously that's not going to, that's not going to, that's going to, that's, the cat won't be happy, and you know, nobody will be happy, and that's going to cause problems for everybody. So, you know, in, in, uh, 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 a, woman, a woman has certain roles, and a man has certain roles, and what really is needed is justice and fairness. And in Islam, that is what is promoted. But unfortunately, as you know, as as um, I'm not talking about here, but as in many, um, as is the case in many places, uh, you know, women, uh, especially in many of the Muslim countries, women are generally oppressed. Which is why you get many women become many Muslim women from those countries becoming feminists. And you also have all the feminists talking about Islam and saying, look how unequal that religion is. So, you know, there's, there's, as we can see from the story of Musaibah, uh, a woman, you know, she was a Quran teacher, she was teaching Hadith. Not only that, she was also fighting in the war. And the Prophet said, I didn't turn wrong, I didn't turn to the right or to the left or in front, except I saw Musaibah standing there protecting me. And he also said, 
about Uhud, he said, on this day, the Sayyid was fighting, he had been better than such and such a man and such and such a man. So, you know, so you get some exceptions even in, in the case of the Sayyidah, she was even fighting in the war. But, um, you know, this is, this is, um, but anyway, Alhamdulillah, you know, in, in particularly in Cambridge, I think we're fortunate that uh, the situation is much better than in many other places, even in the UK. Um, you get places, there's no women's area in the mosque and women, you know, women uh, stay at home and they, they just, uh, yeah. Um, in Cambridge, you know, mashallah, I think um, generally the, it's, 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 uh, it's much better. And in fact, uh, I think um, the women actually won the last two quizzes, didn't they? They won the last two quizzes. Yeah. So today is today is mashallah. Today the brothers have an opportunity to show to show to show that to show everyone that men are smarter than women. Inshallah. And on that on that optimistic note, um, does anyone have any questions? Take that as a note. <coughs> okay, quiz time. Yeah. What time is the pizza coming? Um, ask, ask, uh, ask Uncle Shabazz. Okay, fine, fine. If he knows, it's okay. Yeah, he knows. Okay. Um, yeah. So, brothers versus sisters. So we got, mashallah, we've got this. Um, it's very nice looking cake here, which uh, one of the sisters made. You should call it the amazing cakes. Sure. So, so how does this work? So is it like the, the winners get this one and the losers get this one? Uh, okay. The winner gets first, so, and if it's wrong, they get one each. Shall I, shall I try some to make sure it tastes as good as it looks? No! No, 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 no. I did, I, did that, I did that last time and uh, cake went all over the mic, so maybe I'll, I'll hold myself back. Um, okay, so we have, uh, so there's a cake for the winners. So for a normal question, uh, so I remember last time, obviously as you can see, uh, so as I remember last time, uh, there was a whole thing about raising your hand and, and answering. So this time what we've done is, because there's just one side, so there'll be a question for the brothers and a question for the sisters, anyone can answer without putting their hand up. But, obviously, um, I'm not, um, you have, you, if, if, if I don't hear you, it will be because you know I'm not looking at you. Because if you put your hand up, um, I'll be able to I'll be able to see it. But there won't be any there won't be any marks deducted for, for for saying something without putting your hand up. So anybody can answer from the answering side. Um, okay, so there'll be 60 seconds to give an answer, and after those 60 seconds, the question will be passed to the other side. If nobody's answered after 60 seconds, the question will be passed to the other side um, and they'll have it for 30 seconds to answer. Um, Alright, for an anybody question, these are special questions which are they're marked as anybody in the, in the score sheet, which I'll show you soon. Uh, anyone will be able to answer them from either side, but for this you need to put your hand up because when it's just on one side then anyone can answer. But when it's from both sides, you need to put your hand up first. Oh, and of course, um, where's that? Um, yeah, someone, someone, uh, uh, you can't you can't put your hand up before the question is asked, of course. Once I ask the question, you put your hand up. Uh, so anybody can answer for those questions. Um, they will also have 60 seconds. But, but of course, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you answer, if you answer one of these questions, and I'll make, I'll make sure everyone knows when it's one of them, if you answer any of these questions without putting your hand up, uh, you have one mark deducted. And, and if you've got the correct answer, it will count. Uh, so you need to put your hand up for those, but the other ones will be... Uh, Okay, um, 60 seconds is too long. Too long, is it? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, come here, come here, come here. Uh, Sally. Um, who's, uh, yeah, do you, do you want, do you want to, uh, so I've got a coin, you have to the coin. You either call heads or you call tails, okay? Right. Go stand over there, stand over there. Right, when, right, when you trust us, when you trust us, you you either say heads or tails, okay? Right, everyone, everyone else be quiet, please. It, it's chance, it's chance, right? It doesn't make a difference. 
Okay. You guys all gonna sit down. You guys all gonna sit down a little bit. No one can't sit. I'll, I'll, I'll check. Go sit down. Go sit down. Go sit down. Go sit down. Back where you all. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So three, two, one. Toss it. Tail. You don't catch it, man. You're like, you stick it out on the floor. <laughs> It's, I, I didn't even hear the call. No, <laughs> Did you watch it? It's just tail. Tail. Right, it's, it's on the head. Yay! Alright boys, everybody go right, ahead. Right. <laughs> now I'll be charging you for my computer later. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um... Uh, let me see, where's the... Okay, that's the quiz. Where's the timer? Guys, guys, I've already. Is that so the? So has any has anyone on this side been writing anything down? Yes. Yeah. All right. So it's the 60 seconds will be good for you. On this side, a few people have been writing it down as well. So. If you write things down, 60 seconds is better. And nobody was stopping anyone from writing stuff down, so... Uh... Okay, it's already 9.20, so... Yeah, okay. okay. Has the pizza coming yet, though? No. Right, so round, who's starting yet? The brother is starting. Okay. Yeah, but only one, only one person was calling, she said. She said heads. My dad said she said heads. No, no, she said tails. Oh, sorry, she said tails. It landed on the head. Sorry, I got the wrong. I got the wrong one. Everyone said tails. It landed on the head. Um, okay, so first question for the brothers. Oh, and also, so just everyone um, get acquainted with this complicated scorecard. So for these things, because because they're they're because they're only asked for one side, I put the maximum number of points possible because. In round one, say you answer your question, you get your one point, and you answer the other, the other, the other side's question as well because they couldn't answer it, you get two points. So you can get up to two points in those rounds. Uh, in these ones, or it says anyone, everyone can see it says anyone, yeah? You only get, uh, there's only be one question. In this round, there's only one question I read for both sides. Um, yeah, okay. So for the brothers.
All right, round two. Um, yeah, so the brother's question is, uh, start the timer. Uh, why, were the, why, why were the Ansar so quick to accept the message of the Prophet? You can just say it. Why were the Ansar so quick to accept the message of the Prophet? Because they were younger, 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 to spread Islam in, uh, in Ansar. That means, yes. Um, uh, There's one other thing I mentioned. The young yeah. generation. The young generation. Uh, still one other thing. What's happened to the timer? Sorry? Yeah, that's true as well. Anything else? Yeah? Anything else? Shout out, shout out. There's one other thing. Sorry? Eight, seven, six. All right, time. <laughs> yeah, time's up. Time's up. It's not late anyway. Right, the other thing is, I very clearly mentioned that the Jewish people were living in Medina, and the Jewish people had mentioned to the Muslims that the Prophet is about to come. Oh, not not the Muslims. They mentioned to the people in Medina, the Prophet is about to come. So when they went and met the Prophet, they already knew about the Prophet, which is why they were so quick to to accept. But the answer was not Jewish. Sorry? The answer was not Jewish. They believe. They believe. That's kind of their point. Yeah? <laughs> That's one. That's one. Which round is this? It's round, it's round two. Round two, okay, fine. They got one. They mentioned that uh, all, the, all the senior leaders were killed. That's one thing. The other thing is they already knew about him because the Jewish tribes were there in Medina as well. Okay, there's sister's question. You want to start the timer? Yeah. We need we need an expert ten seconds. Okay. All right. The question is, why did Abdullah ibn Ubay hate the Prophet so much? Because um. What do you? He, he, he wanted to be a leader. Sorry? Why did he want to be a leader? Because he was the only one left. He was the only one left, yes. And he thought he'd be the leader. Yeah, that's correct. One thing is, all the leaders were, all the others were killed, and he himself wanted to be the leader. And when the trouble came, he couldn't be. So that's why. So they get two marks for that. Yeah! They get two. Yeah, they get two marks. Right, make sure you. Okay, fine. fine. So is it? It's two, two, two. Okay, fine. All right, now it's round three. Round right? three. Yep. Okay. All right. The brother's question is: uh, What did Amr bin Al As say when he heard Musaylama's Quran? Yeah. You know that I know that. Oh yeah, that you're lying. You're, you're, you're lying. You know that I know that you're a liar. Yes. Yes. That's yes. Correct. I remember. Okay. So that's one mark for that. Hey. You know, last time, last time the brothers were saying, the brothers were really upset about this putting your hands up thing because it cost them a lot of marks. And now they're all shouting at the same time, so I can't hear anything they're saying. So I changed the rule for you, but now it's, it's not really, it's not really working very well. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Just, just put, make sure, did you put the one marking? All right, the women's question is. Uh, the women's question is What special dua did the Prophet Sallallahu make for the family of Musayba? Time's up. Sure someone's got it? What special dua? Do you mean repeat the answer or repeat the question? <laughs> what special du'a did the Prophet make for the family of Musaiba? Yeah? Um, he made du'a that they'll be in pilot school. Yeah, that's correct, yes. Yeah. <coughs> what? 
That's it. Turn up here. One more. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Has that? Has that done it? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Round. All right. This is the anyone yes. question. This is the anyone question. Yes. Sorry. What is the du'a? Sorry? What is the du'a? He made du'a that 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 family will be his uh, will accompany him in paradise. Will be his friend in paradise. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah. All right, so now anyone can answer this. Uh, no matter you go and sit on the men's side. What's the question? <coughs> so, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So anyone can answer. Uh, you need to make sure you get the timer. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, so now the question is. You know how you know I mentioned that there were, you can only put your hand up, remember? If anyone shouts anything without putting their hand up, their team will lose one mark, yeah? So no, no shouting anything out. Now you know. Sorry? You changed the rules, you need to call it No, I told you at the beginning. Was, I told you at the beginning, there's some special questions where. Okay, yeah, no problem. So yeah? Hope everyone read the rules. Okay, come on. Yep, yep. So, one mark for this. You have to put your hand up before asking. I've told you already if you put your hand up before the question is asked, you'll lose your mark. <laughs> You've got a reputation for doing that. MashaAllah. Okay, um, um, okay, the question is, you know how I mentioned that the first time, 12 people went and they gave the Pledge of Allegiance. The second time, 70 men went and a couple of women went and they gave the, they gave the Pledge over there as well. Okay, the question is, the first Pledge of Allegiance, uh, even though it was not attended by any women, the first one wasn't attended by any women. The second one was attended by two women, right? Yeah. The first pledge of allegiance. The first pledge of allegiance is called the pledge of the women. Why would that be? Why is that? Yeah. No, that was in the second one. Yeah. Because there's a verse in the Quran which talks about the pledge given to the women. Yes! So you say the same thing, carry on, carry on, carry on. There's a verse in the Quran that talks about those things which are pledges of the women. Yes. Yes, yes. If you say, Allah, you should not be like you, Allah, you should not be like you, Allah, you should not be like you, Allah, in the second one, they gave the Pledge of Allegiance not just to be Muslim, not just to worship Allah, but also that they're going to defend the Prophet like they defend their own children, uh, women and children. And this is primarily what the men would do. So, the, so when, when normally when women would come, they would just pledge to basically to be good Muslims, essentially. When the men come, they have to pledge that they are going to protect the Prophet as well. So the first one, so in the first one, hold on, hold on. In the first one, uh, they just pledged to, um, the first one, they were all men, but they only pledged, uh, uh, that, yeah, as what you said, what's in the Quran. So that one was known as the Pledge of the Women, even though the second was attended by two women, the first one was attended by eight. And so that mark goes to the brother's side. Did you do it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Right, the next round. Um, oh, okay, right. Um, brothers, four, 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 four. Okay, the the um, the brothers' question is. Four, three. This is for the brothers now. It's not for. Yeah, four, why? Why did? The, can you give me one reason why the people of Musaylama followed him even though his quote unquote Quran was ridiculous? Why did they follow him? Yeah. Because they wanted to follow somebody from their he own got tribe. It. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's one more for the brothers. Uh, you can just reset, just reset the time. Okay, fine. Right, yeah? Set the time again. Maybe we can do it round by round, so... If you do, if you do one round and then you can do Yeah, okay. So... Okay, the, qu the question for the women is... Why were, uh, why were Arabs so good at preserving the names of all their ancestors? Why were they so keen to? Why were they so keen to? Yeah? Yeah, maybe you do it. Okay. So that's one for the sisters. Alright, next question is. This question is for the brothers. It's a two mark question. Two mark question, yes. Five, 
Okay, two more questions uh, for the brothers. Who were the two sons of Nusayba? Who were the two sons of Nusayba? Yeah? Habib and Abdullah. Habib and Abdullah. Ibn Zayd. Yes, Ibn Zayd. Ibn Zayd. Ibn Zayd. Alright, the women's question. The women's question. There's two marker. Uh, okay, this the women's question. What were the two things? What were the two things which the Ansar asked the Prophet before giving him the Pledge of Allegiance? What were those two things? He asked him two things. Yeah? What will be our reward? What will be our reward? That's one of them. Yeah? Stay with them. Yeah, he'll stay with them. Yeah. Okay. So two marks, two marks for the women. Okay. Um, all right. What? Okay. The, the, the question for the brothers is: What is or what did I mention? Is is the best way? So you know, in in an, in an era where you know many people are you know, having doubts about the religion, many people are in fact leaving Islam as well. What is the best way for someone to protect themselves from leaving Islam? Yeah. Learn the religion. Learn the religion more, exactly. Sorry? <laughs> He's taking revenge on Maya. Yeah. Aya, it's your dad. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, just fill, 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 fill. Uh, okay, okay, actually, wait, wait, set this time first, and then you can fill in the answers, yeah? yeah? Okay, so, uh, so, the question for the women is. Okay, out of respect, Arabs would never address someone older than them using their name. What would they use instead? Yeah? Nikunya. Okay, so... Okay, fine. One each, yeah? One each. Okay. Alright, this is the anyone question, yeah? Anyone question? No, 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 no. If you shout out, if you shout out, you lose them all. The sisters have to get this to share the cake. Share. What? Share. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so the question is, you know how I mentioned, you know how I mentioned that the Arabs were very generous people. The Arabs were very generous people. And in fact, there's someone called Al Walid ibn Al Muhira. Yeah. Let me ask the question, yeah? yeah. I'll, I'll take the mask off if you think. Everyone has to be quiet while I ask the question. Um, there was someone called Al Walid ibn Al Muhira, and he, he actually, it said that you know before the, before the coming of the Prophet, they had to renovate the Kaaba, they had to rebuild the Kaaba, and it said that Al Walid ibn Al Walid ibn Al Muhira, he was so generous that he single-handedly paid for the whole cost of renovating the Kaaba. Um, in spite of all of this, in the Quran it says about Al Walid ibn Al Muhira. Sa'usli he suffer, he will burn in the hellfire. Um, so now one thing is he was a Muslim, but apart from that, can anyone tell me what was fundamentally wrong with all of the charity that this man used to give? What was wrong with yeah? Yes, he wanted to show up, very good. Yes, it's intention. I thought that would take a while. Why? How do you know that? Sorry? How do you know that? Because um, they used to they used to do all this poetry talking about their, how generous they were. So they would have poetry talking about oh I gave this and this and this and I did this and you know I. So that's why that's why these, these people. There's another there's another story actually of how um, uh, once there was one poet he went to another he went he went and stayed with another poet. <laughs> Is it too loud or the pizza says? Pizza, can't smell the pizza. Can't smell the pizza, okay. When they got. Alright, so, so one of these poets, he went, he went to the house, of, he went to, and stayed with another poet, and that, other, that, uh, that guy, he was very stingy and didn't offer him anything. So this poet, he went and made some poetic, poetic verse about him. He said, um, uh, Leave all the generosity and just just sit down 
and don't do anything because you are just somebody who feeds himself and, and talks himself basically. And then uh, they complain to Umar about this, the caliph, and Umar thought, okay, there's nothing wrong with this. But one of the other poets, he said, he basically killed him with his poetry. By, by calling him miserly, he basically killed him. So their poetry was very, that everyone would know when someone's done something generous or something, someone's done something uh, stingy. And that was very, and uh, so on. So, and what he did in Mubina, he was very generous, but mostly shut up. And, as we know in Islam, it's all based on intention, isn't it? Um, and which is, you know, it's also, uh, can be positive as well, because, you know, uh, none of us here are millionaires or billionaires or anything. But we can still, even giving a small amount, if we give it with the right intention, we can get more reward than somebody giving millions and millions of pounds just so that their name will be put on the thing to say, oh, this person gave such and such a large amount of money. If we give it the right intention, even a small amount can be better than a big amount. Okay. Anyway, um, did you put them up for that? Yeah, yeah. Sisters are leading. Are they? Yeah. No, I don't. Because... Oh, no, okay, okay. okay. Um, Alright, number nine. Question number nine. This is for the, the brothers. Um, okay, why did... So remember I said Ashad ibn Zawara, he put his hand on the hand of the Prophet uh, before, when everyone was about to pledge allegiance. So why did he... Why did he delay everyone from pledging allegiance to the Prophet, to the brothers, to the brothers, to the brothers? Why did he delay everyone from giving their pledge of allegiance? What was his reason? Why did he want to delay it? Why did he stop them? Yeah? Why did Asahad ibn Zarah, he's the one who he's the one who's hosting Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Yet when everyone's about to pledge the region with Prophet, that he can come to Medina and they're protecting like they protect their own women and children, he said stop, wait. And he delayed, yeah? He wanted to make sure that they knew what they were getting into. Yes, exactly. He wanted to make sure they knew what they were getting into. That they were serious about it. Okay. Okay. Women's question. <laughs> Alright, there. Okay. Is time ready? Okay, what 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 virtue, what special thing does a does a person um, the person who's fasting, when food is eaten in front of them, what special virtue do they get? Yeah? The angels but the angels say, yeah, the angels say Allah Okay. Okay. Allah Okay. Okay, did you did you put those marks? Alright, next question is Okay, this one is for the brothers. What? So you know the, the verse I mentioned? Inna muslimina wa muslimati wa mu'minina wa mu'minati wa qalitina or this verse? What What did I mention which happened just before this verse was revealed? Yeah? The same verse, 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 the same Okay, so, um, so, start the time with us and we can mark it off. Okay, the women's question, there's two months for this, right? Um, okay, what was the reply of the Prophet when Musaylama asked him to split the earth in half? Well, what did the Prophet say to him in his letter back? Yeah? That wasn't in the letter back, that was... Uh, anyone else? Yes, very good. Um, and what did he address him as? What did he call him? He said about that, yeah. Okay, so let's... Two, two each, yeah? Okay, two, did you, you put, put two for each of them? Okay, this is the very last question. This is the very last question. I think, what's happening now? The women are winning, aren't they? By one mark. And this is the anybody question, and it's one mark. So if the brothers win, if the brothers win, then we've only got this, this, we haven't got enough cake, so if the brothers win, nobody will get cake, and I'll just take all the cake home myself because it will be a draw. So, so, so either the brothers lose, give them the cake, and then they, they might share some with you. You're a brother yourself! <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the question, why are you all standing up? Sit down. Sit down, boys. Sit, sit down. down, please. Sit down, everyone sit down. Boys, sit down, sit down, go there, it's recording. <coughs> okay, I remember, okay, there's one mark list. I mentioned last time we did, uh, did anyone, was anyone here last time? What did we do last time? Last time we did this session. 
Abu Huraira, yes. I mentioned Abu Huraira, he had a special routine where in the night you make sure that all night someone is praying in his house. So he will pray for one third, his daughter will pray for one third, his wife will pray for one third, the whole night someone is praying in his house. What I didn't mention is there was a specific incident which pushed Abu Huraira to do this, pushed Abu Huraira into this special routine. Um, can anyone suggest what it is? <laughs> can anyone suggest there's a specific, something specific which happened which pushed Abu Huraira into doing this very uh, uh, devout routine? Can anyone mention it? Can anyone suggest? Can anyone? His routine, after something happened, something happened, and then Abu Huraira went home and he started praying all night. Or, making, or praying one third, and his wife will pray one third, his uh, daughter will pray one third. There was one thing which happened, yeah? Prophet Muhammad said to him that Allah SWT coming the nearest. Uh, good try, but not that. Yeah? No, it's not that. I'll, 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 I'll give you guys a clue. This isn't something which I, which I mentioned at the last session. So for anyone, anyone here who's, who didn't come last time, this is something I mentioned today. I mentioned something today. Um, can anyone else suggest something? <laughs> Where's the timer? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Someone put their hand up. Someone put, yeah? What hadith? <laughs> no. It's one point, there's no half points. Alright, you know what? Uh, you know what? One minute has now gone, according to my watch, because the time will start late. So I'm going to say that nobody got that question, I'll give you guys the answer. The answer is, I mentioned this hadith, there was this man called Raja, right? He was sitting in a gathering with the Prophet and Abu Huraira was there as well. And the Prophet said to him, there is one of you who in hellfire, his, what, just one of his teeth is bigger than a mountain. And Abu Huraira said, all of the people who were there, they all died on Islam, except me and him. And then Abu Huraira became very concerned, because now he's thinking, now he's thinking, what? And then when he went back, Abu Huraira was happy about it, and so started thanking Allah by praying. <laughs> and so Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira became very, very concerned now, because there's only two of them left. And he's thinking, does it profit me that I'm the one who will be in hellfire? So then Abu Huraira, started this, this routine, he was praying all night, you know, asking Allah for forgiveness, asking Allah to guide him and so on. To, because he didn't want to be he didn't want to be that person who the Prophet had said would be in hellfire. Was so, sorry? It wasn't an easy question. It wasn't an easy question, but it wasn't the brother's question, it was everyone's question. So everyone faced everyone faced a difficult question. The the questions for both sides are always going to be difficult. So nobody got that mark. What's the score then? Can you, 11, 12. Twelve. Twelve, eleven to the bottom, right? Oh. Okay, so the sisters won twelve, eleven. Brothers, the brothers can go home and ruin their mistakes. <laughs> Think about how they could come back next time and take more work and and uh, I like that. Okay, just a couple of things. So, um, of course, the pizza is um, here over here. Um, just, a lot, just one thing I want to mention. That just one thing I want to mention. Um, you know, as everyone, one thing I want to mention, as you know, everyone, as everyone might have realized, we're trying to do these sessions every month. Um, we're trying to do these sessions every month. So, um, and apart from apart from apart from giving the talk, there are a number of different different small tasks to be done. So, and it would be great. You know, we already have some people volunteering and doing some things. But for anyone else who's interested, it would be great if you know you come, uh, if you can, you know. Um, uh, volunteered, you know, there are set a number of different things to do besides uh, besides you know, giving talk and actual there are other stuff to organize it. And in fact, if anyone, if anyone wants to come and give a talk, you're welcome to do that as well. You can come and give a talk. All, all those who are under the age of um, uh, nine, 18, 19, something like that, come and give a talk, inshallah. So yeah, that's one thing. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's about it, you know, inshallah. If, if people can, you know, volunteer to help, uh, you know, come and set up and there's all these different stuff to do. Jazakumullah uh, khair for listening. I know it's been quite long. We said we'd finish at 9. We started late and now it's 9.05, but 
I'm sure for the sisters it was worth it. The one, the brothers are just looking very grumpy. Um, anyway, Zach, Mark, yeah, we got pizza.